Hey, everybody. This is the Freakopolis Times, our podcast, mostly about stuff related to our comics and game shop, the Freakopolis Geekery. We're Ian, Tyler, and Troy, and we run the shop and host this podcast. Join us and some occasional guests as we talk comics, games, pop culture, and just about anything else that pops up. Remember, while some of our topics can get a little geeky, they change up often, so hang in there and maybe the next one will be more your style. By the way, this podcast is video enhanced on YouTube and Spotify. Check it out if you're feeling left out on the visuals. You never know what might show up. Now, let's do the show. We have the biggest crossover event of the universe. Of all time. Of all time. Of all universes. Of, yes. Yeah. This is bigger than, than Marvel DC. This is bigger than Disney princesses with the Iron Giant with Warner Brothers <laughs> with Nickelodeon. No. This is this is a big, big old deal. And it actually kind of is, weirdly enough. Yeah. Uh, people really are excited over this series, and that is Fortnite x Marvel Zero sure. War. Yeah, yeah. Fortnite being arguably the biggest uh, video game going, and Marvel the biggest comic company, so it is sort of the clash of the two biggest universes. It is. Well, it's sort of a reversal of roles, right? Because Fortnite includes all of these various IPs. You know, they got Master Chief and Chun-Li and, and Iron Man. But that, was after, that was after time, yeah. I mean, originally, no. And then they started adopting well, that. Pretty quickly. They were like, well, let's get John Wick in here. And, and I think when I played it, it didn't have that stuff. It just had Fortnite guys. Pretty early on, they started putting them in. But oh, yeah. now it's Marvel. Uh, bringing in Fortnite, <laughs> which yeah, is interesting. Yeah. It's on the flip side. It's the, the physical medium of comics having some Fortnite dashed in instead of the uh, digital medium of Fortnite yeah. having some Marvel dashed yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, because I know that, that you could play Spider-Man and stuff in Fortnite. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's kind of cool like to turn it around and bring the Fortnite guys into a Marvel comic. Yeah, and it sounds as though... These uh, big Marvel characters, Spider-Man, Wolverine, Iron Man, uh, make their way to the Fortnite Island <laughs> of all places. Somehow, I'm sure, through some uh, cross-universe jumping portals or whatever, they end up in the land of Battle Royales. Indeed. It's it's a mini-series, I forget, five or six issues? Something like that, yeah. Um and it's going on right now. I think they're probably on issue three or four is out right now. As a shop, we tend to get more trade paperbacks. Mm -hmm. um, so w basically, we get the collected editions, which will be out a little later this year. I think it's scheduled for October, end of October, or early November uh, for the collected edition, which includes the whole thing in it. Very cool. uh, it, it looks like it's going to have an awesome cover uh, that combined, you know, that one of those... Tons of characters of from both universes mixing. The together. covers for this miniseries have been a pretty big deal. Some of the variants and stuff pull in the big hitters from Marvel artists and are running a pretty penny. You know, they're they're desirable collectibles, obviously, because uh, like we said, it's a huge crossover. It, it might not necessarily appeal to me, but I see why they would do something like this. And as a miniseries, you know, it's off to the side. It's not going to intrude in on your current The Amazing Spider-Man run. Uh, it just is something you can dig into if you're a huge fan, I guess. Yeah, it's going to be just a huge new kind of uh, uh, ensemble cast. Includes everything and everyone from everywhere. Uh, and you get to see all of those make an appearance and a cameo and all of that, which makes it a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, Fortnite really is... The king of crossovers. Mm -hmm. They were the first ones to pretty much capitalize wholly on battle royales. So adding in all these other characters and stuff, it, it put them in another league. I mean, Apex Legends played the heck out of it. It's awesome, but Fortnite still has that edge of working with all these other companies. Yeah, having all those sort of licensed characters. It yeah. kind of reminds me of Hero Clicks that way. Where yeah, right. One yeah. of the reasons Hero Clicks is a standout is because it's got all those licensed characters. 
Um, and so, yeah, seeing that happen sort of here, seeing it in reverse and coming into the Marvel side of things, letting Marvel put their spin on, you know, that sort of a story, why Spider-Man would be in the Fortnite universe mm -hmm. and kind of spinning it around that way. Um, it's, it's probably going to be really cool. And hopefully it exposes people that follow Fortnite to comics and sort of what Marvel's like now for real in, at the comics level. Yeah. Um, It'd be kind of cool to see if they ever made a movie like that, but uh, or or an animated uh, cartoon. I'm sure they could try. A Fortnite movie would be legendary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pulling in from all those IPs. No, you see, I wonder if there's any uh, six or seven year olds out there grabbing the comic and going like, "Oh man, I'm all in on this for Alex from Fortnite." It's yeah, like, not, not Iron Man, <laughs> not, not Spider Man, like the Fortnite character. What kind of deep lore and, and history and moral foundation do the Fortnite characters boast? <laughs> There's a lot more than you think. Yeah, yeah. right. Apparently, you, so. uh, you've got a you've got a nephew that's what nine, mm -hmm. I think, um, and he's a he's known Fortnite his whole life, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a big deal. It's a big uh, franchise for them. I get that, but it still feels as though those characters. <laughs> are are just avatars for a battle royale to me, and and not so much characters with you know Uncle Ben as part of their motivations. Oh, oh exactly, stuff. exactly. <laughs> I mean, even the Spider Man in Fortnite to me, you know, it's a skin. Mm -hmm. It's not a role playing character. No, they add the adaptability of that engine is incredible. They yeah. add actual mechanics, you know, you can what? swing yeah, around you get, like you get his web slingers stuff. or if you pick up the infinity gauntlet, you become Thanos and can beam people down and stuff. Get 999 health or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, really? Oh, yeah. that's fun. It is. And it, it speaks to the main strength of that game in that they're able to update it at such an incredible pace and introduce these mechanics and stuff. But that is completely different than the Fortnite that we experienced. Right, well, <laughs> like, when I played Fortnite, it was all about the building, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Now even that is and no more. <laughs> no more building. Yeah, there's been quite the evolution of Fortnite. Yeah, we played in the season one mm -hmm. where nobody was really very good at the building yet. So if you were even half decent, you had a huge leg up. And yeah. you feared the John Wick. I was just saying, if somebody had a John Wick skin, you knew you had to run. Yeah. Because those people those were, were pros. Yeah. <laughs> um, we ended up with some crazy matches of Fortnite. Oh, no, like sure. 30 kills in total and stuff. It Early was, on. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it was really cool, for sure. But that was actually generally prior to its explosive growth into the mainstream of all video gaming. No, yeah. yeah, it wasn't the biggest thing. No. When we tried it. And so it's interesting to see now that there's such huge crossovers on both ends of the table. And admittedly, though I haven't read it personally, it seems as though the concept for this story is kind of fun. A lot of your favorite big Marvel heroes get brought to the Fortnite Battle Royale Island and come across some of their main characters, and they together have to determine a way to stop the never-ending Fortnite war. <laughs> yeah, right. It's almost like a parody. <laughs> like, <laughs> I will say the events they have in Fortnite are crazy yeah, when yeah. they pull those off. Like having rappers perform huge uh, concerts oh. that like thousands of people join Live and watch. Live yeah. stuff, sure. Yeah, yeah. Crazy They're... animations and stuff. It's... They've pulled will... off some revolutionary kind of attempts at things, yeah. Uh, okay, so they're they're using that as as a online venue. Yeah, they have yeah. And can you f can the audience break out in a brawl and start like uh, in some of them and other ones you're just kind of along for the ride. Yeah. Okay. Or you'll be put into a dancing animation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get close enough or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And they put. Fortnite at the beginning of the title. It's what? Fortnite X Marvel. It's not Marvel X Marvel's Fortnite. the one printing these books. Wow. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> you know it's going to be Marvel. Uh, alphabetically, it's correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. What rolls off the tongue? Like Marvel ever cared for that, Atlas <laughs> Comics, or like, gotta get anything before, before DC. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, we, we do know that like, 
Nothing makes more money than video games. Oh, man, yeah. Oh. Diablo Immortal. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. Have you seen what's going on with that one? To get a max level character in Blizzard's new gotcha mobile Diablo game, Diablo Immortal, you gotta spend like 4.2 million, million bucks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's insane. Streamers are dropping $50,000 and getting nothing <laughs> for progression, you know? What? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's egregious. There's articles every day that are like, Diablo Immortal is just the beginning of a wasteland of non-supervised gaming gambling, you know? Like, <laughs> uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, if you join a multiplayer match, you'll actively be paired up, and you don't spend money on the game? You'll be actively paired up with people who do, so that you'll just get curb stomped and make you want to spend some real cash. I'm sure there's all sorts of manipulation in order to get you to spend money on the game, because it... And though I've read that, like, you can play the game for free, for sure, the very fact that once you do start spending money, it puts you on this endless rope to the point where you could mortgage your house against the upgrades and get nothing. <laughs> wow. And get nothing. <laughs> wow, this, I mean, it sounds like a, an EVE Online kind of... Uh... At least in EVE, your ships retain their value or whatever, you know, like, it's... But the scale of it, yes, to where people are spending that degree of money, like, legitimate... You, you can buy a car or a house with that much money, and for, for digital nothingness, <laughs> it's... It's wild that, but this is now a, a, yeah, an egregious example of this philosophy of gaming. Yeah, it's like this crazy pyramid scheme where you gotta spend money to possibly get a gem that you need, and you need five of those gems. And once you combine those five, you need five gems to make another five of those gems. Well, <laughs> and it's like... So, like, at the beginning when it was first released, it was estimated, someone did the math and they were like, Okay, so based on what we can see at the max level, to be able to get a fully kitted out, perfect character with like plus 10 gems or whatever, all the way around, uh, is going to cost like $168,000. And everyone was like, $168,000 for a mobile gotcha game? Like, that's crazy. Then someone did it, and they discovered that there's another layer of gem upgrades underneath. Oh, jeez. And they're like, well, if you continue down this path, like, it becomes exponentially more expensive. So, that, like, now it costs, like, two and a half million dollars wow. in order to get a fully upgraded character in this game. And the very fact that they would implement such degrees of spending is crazy. crazy. It, it indicates that someone will do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, they have. Yeah, yeah. I think so it's... More made, power to them, man. It's, it's made like... <laughs> 50 million dollars in its first month. Wow. Which might not sound like much, but... In the video game oh, scale. From most to mere pittance. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. Why lonely even, blizzards. Why yeah. even be in the business? <laughs> yes. Activliz can can brush away to the wind with profits like that. <laughs> no. They uh <laughs> they're going to do just fine, I'm sure. Though I don't believe you can even download the game in some European countries. <laughs> yeah, in like Sweden and the UK and stuff. It's considered a financial weapon. <laughs> Against children, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Or their parents' that, wallets, yeah. Children that have access to millions. Yeah, or whatever, yeah. They, I mean, it really has ramped it up to a crazy scale where it's like, why could anyone spend that much money on a game? <laughs> on a game, on a digital game, even. I can understand collectibles. Right. It ends up being like, oh, that, that thing's worth half a million dollars because there's only three of them in the world. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. But a, a a maxed out character in Diablo Immortal means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe they make each character into an NFT or something. Uh, now and, that's the next level. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you gotta buy that up. Yeah. As they, they get ownership of your NFT until you buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I guess then that would allow you to sell the character as a right. 
It allows them to sell your character twice. We sell the character to you to level up, but at the same time, we constantly capture NFTs of your character to sell to people. (laughs) On the online marketplace. As well as your medical information for some reason. Superhero slash team hideouts. Or like main bases. I'm talking like Avengers Tower, that warehouse floor they have in the boys, or whatever that is. Sort of like penthouse apartment. Team Titans Tower. Right. What's your favorite? Uh, There's sort of gothic noir, Mm -hmm. uh, foggy window look that they got going on there. Mm -hmm. Big tall ceilings. Yeah, huge vaulted ceilings. Yeah, that's a good question. It's quite a few, I guess. Venture Brothers facility. <laughs> <laughs> or the, the Mighty Monarchs. The cocoon? The cocoon. Yes, this flying cocoon. What makes a good which, base? Which makes... <laughs> well, the flying cocoon's got... It's got be. everything you need. Yeah. <laughs> flying cocoon has been destroyed like four times over. Many times. That makes sense too, though. I mean... Cocoons should not be flying. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That's a good point. I haven't considered that. Actually. They're also made to be destroyed. So, between those two aspects. All it takes is 2 ton 21 and what, 22? 24? 24. 24. They'll, yeah. they'll fix it right up. <laughs> Apparently With so. With Dr. My Wife, girlfriend. <laughs> is that who she is? Right. You need a rewatch, apparently. Well, you know, I'm not sure the proper title. Right. Dr. Mrs. the Monarch. Right. There we go. It depends on the season. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dr. My Wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, I don't know. There's something. There's an appeal to the Batcave. I was just saying sure. the Batcave. The Batcave has all those mementos of Batman's rogue gallery and stuff. Right. Yeah, Batcave makes a lot more sense. Like, I'm a big fan of the Fantastic Four. Yeah. But, like, the idea of having your headquarters in sort of the top of a well-known skyscraper just seems problematic. Past the the early 2000s, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) We've we've kind of learned. That's That's not not the way to go. That's not the best idea for your headquarters. No, I would imagine Uh, not. The Batcave seems like a, you know, keeping it secret, having it be, like, underground, those are good ideas. Mm -hmm. Those are good ideas. The Baxter Building, the Avengers Tower, all that kind of stuff is, is very prominent. Those are some some outward facing superheroes for sure. Yeah, they don't mind saying, hey, this is where we are right here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, now granted, Reed Richards from the Fantastic Four, or, or I suppose Tony Stark, you know, they, I'm sure they have automated defenses yeah, and yeah. stuff. Um, but Wow, that's that is you it's know, a bold statement. It's a sure. bold statement, yeah. it really is. Yeah, you got to be confident in the power of yourself and your teammates. Too. Admittedly, the Fantastic Four and the Avengers are uh, not easily defeated. So, if I would put anyone out there in the open, it would probably be them. But at the same time, there's a lot of heroes who uh, are thinking it a little more down to scale, and that works better for them. Like, uh, Matt Murdock has his. Lawyer's office, essentially, yeah, you know. Yeah. There's some smaller bases of operation that end up working for people pretty well. Yeah, I mean, I like the boys' headquarters. Yep, yeah, yeah, that's you a good know, example. We just saw that one, you know, kind of quite a bit this week in the season finale. Mm-hmm. Basically what they've got, they, they got a cool private space that no one knows about and uh, probably some really good Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, and that's, that's that's the extent of it. Yeah, yeah that's pretty much it. <laughs> well, there's also uh, Jessica Jones has Atlas Investigations. Uh, it's probably in the same freaking hall as Murdoch. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Murdoch and Nelson. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. Uh, does Luke Cage and Iron Fist do they have a, a dojo or something? Gym? Yeah. <laughs> um, I I haven't seen Danny Rand probably has a bunch of stuff. 
You know? Right, well, yeah. in theory he does. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of different locations. Mm-hmm. Probably got a dojo on a plane. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> that would be cool. In the, in the back of a big AC-130 or whatever. Yeah, a big giant cargo plane. Dive bomb so that we might fight in zero G. <laughs> 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 but, uh, Jarvis zero G mode. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anyone else? Peter, uh, he's made use of his room. Peter Parker? Yeah, yeah, Peter Parker. More often than not, he turns that place into a uh, impromptu science lab. <laughs> Taylor yeah. shop. Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. It's multi-purpose for him. Interesting that they never really like delve into what he has available to him there. I know. I mean, it's like they tacked on, like Stan Lee kind of tacked on the idea of, uh, oh, he mixes up his own yeah. web fluid. Because really, I mean, it's like he can do these incredibly remarkable, both his web fluid and his spider tracers that he builds in his own facilities mm-hmm. are like better than everything else in, in that category. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, web fluid is probably one of the coolest uh, uh, chemical compounds in the Marvel universe. Yeah. Uh, those spider tracers are like invulnerable and, you yeah, know, yeah. They're incredibly work useful. perfectly yeah. and they're tuned to his own spider sense yep. and all of this. It's like, man, it's like if he could do that, why doesn't he crack out inventions just left and right? Yeah, you know, true like, enough. Yeah. They definitely kind of capped him with his initial inventions. <laughs> and now that's all the room he has in the closet of his headquarters uh, to, that, where his science kit is set up. For some reason, he lacks inspiration. He's just like, well, I uh, added some glider wings to my suit. <laughs> it's like... Oh, come on, Spidey. Just <laughs> 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 Can you make, like, invisibility fabric? <laughs> you know? Yeah, that, that does seem within the realm of possibility. <laughs> like, Kite Man does the same kind of stuff. <laughs> For God's sake. Kite Man from the Harley Quinn animated yes. series. Or... For the listeners at home, yeah, yeah, that's where you'll that's find a, Kite Man. That's a that's a cross dimension yeah. reference, yeah. But he's existed as a, a Batman thing in the era of really, really campy, ridiculous, unwanted Batman and Superman stories. Yes, <laughs> like unnecessary. It's filler. Perfect for annuals. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Stuff like Some that. of the editors aren't hanging around for some reason. <laughs> right. But instead, like, oh, now because Batman is wearing a, a rainbow suit, he is completely psychotic and <laughs> doesn't want to be Batman anymore. It's like, who, who came up with this? Who cares? And I guess it comes back around to Batman because the Batcave is the ultimate. The Batcave, yeah. yeah. I think that wins, honestly. Now we did recently see in um, uh, in a recent comic club we read Kevin Smith's Green Hornet, mm-hmm. um, and Green Hornet also had in, in that series basically the equivalence of a bat cave, the Hornet's um, Nest. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that was an interesting one. It was very gothic noir, too. Yeah, it was definitely uh, entirely in homage to Batman. Oh, yeah. big time. <laughs> Kevin Smith tilting the hat there, for yeah. sure. Um, it even had some weird things, like that turntable that the car could park yes. on. And then yeah. it would flip it around. Flip and, yeah. it upside down. Uh, yeah. It's like, that, okay, that, there's no reason for that. No reason <laughs> it should even need to exist, but... It just shows how uh, advanced uh, the original builder of the the uh, hornet's nest was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty cool. It's a. Uh, it feels like something that heroes need to be superheroes. Oh yeah, it's a, uh, a base to call their own. <laughs> I did notice recently that the new version of the Savage Worlds superpowers. Did a did a, uh, a companion did a rework of the headquarters building capabilities. So uh, it sounds like they've made it even cooler to have headquarters in uh, Savage World Supers campaigns. 
Really? Yep. So if you're a headquarters fan, uh, they're they're definitely giving you some of that fan service. You can base a whole campaign around progressing your That's headquarters. Like building up a headquarters. Yeah, yeah that sounds yeah. really fun. Yeah. yeah. They have headquarters points, and you have all those different rooms you can buy with points and all of that. So it definitely lets you build an amazing headquarters. I'm sure there's a starting edge you can take that gives you a starting headquarters and you know, right. a bunch of points. It's okay, but so with all those choices, the decision for sort of best headquarters that we can think of is... The Batcave. The Batcave. I yeah. guess, yeah, we, we talked about all those other ones, but still the Batcave. Yeah, he's got that amazing computer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did he build that? He must have. Is that a Wayne? Maybe it was all Alfred. Wayne Company I was computer. Just say, what he really has is Alfred. Mm-hmm. Alfred is everything you need in one one guy just waiting for you. So the reason the Batcave wins is because of Alfred? Probably. Yeah, honestly. that sounds like... A I just, no, 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 wait. They got those fire poles. <laughs> yes, yeah. Does that exist in the bigger... Like in the in the comics version, or was that just in Adam West? I'm sure it is referenced in the comics. I haven't seen the Batcave in a little while. When they go down the fire poles... I've seen a number of Batcave representations. Do they come out the bottom in their suits? Even if they went <laughs> down the I don't top. think so, no. Right, no? No, the Only suits. In SpongeBob. Oh. <laughs> the suits are kept down there in like hermetically sealed closet things. Um, Fair enough. But yeah, I, I'm going to say yes. If the fire poles are part of it, you got to give it to the back cave. Put the fire poles and Alfred together. What do you get? The best thing about the back <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there we go. The winner's the back cave because of the fire poles and out. <laughs> let us know your favorite and why the back cave is the best. Yeah. Yes, let us know why the back cave is the best or your alternative favorite. Having had now read the Department of Truth for our comic book club meeting, actually this evening. That was a wild ride. That was a crazy <laughs> book. Oh my god! Yeah, you get to a point in that book where, okay, all of a sudden now you don't, you can't put it down. Oh yeah. yeah. Halfway through it, it flips over to some very uh, uh, prevalent topics in America, and it drives home some hard hitting points and uh, some relevancy that you wouldn't first anticipate with such a crazy book, but. It also had some really, really striking art throughout. That might be even stronger than its narrative. Uh, it was a super crazy ride to see all that different styles mash together. I didn't get to fully read through it, but yeah, the techniques used in just producing the book in general is kind of staggering. Yeah, and I, I like the way, like, I mean, it's it's got... Um, an incredible amount of emotion Mm -hmm. um, in its artwork, but it's like they intentionally kept it sort of blurred. Yeah. Um, You know, it's, it's, it's never in crisp detail. Um, All of the art is sort of a, a softer, more out of focus kind of, uh, uh, watercolory yeah, style yeah yeah all, almost dreamlike mm-hmm. or you know uh and and I, I think that helped to carry the ideas that that the the narrative is about yeah yeah often the uh background and stuff would kind of blend into this very surreal blur but the characters themselves had a good design behind them too very recognizable uh in spite of that a little bit washed out blurry style it is really really excellent and striking to look at because it also has some dashes of extra mediums thrown in too uh for some really striking imagery especially when it comes to like the woman in red and stuff uh i found that the narrative as far as like the text boxes and stuff went uh was pretty strong in what they were trying to sell you on the the craziness of all these conspiracies and how they wind together, how you can't really trust anything in this world. The dialogue, however, uh, 
was really strong, but felt so real that right. it was almost hard to follow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's definitely what a real conversation sounds like, but, uh... Oh, In a comic book. Yeah, what, what were they talking about exactly? <laughs> like, yeah. Okay, but in all fairness, I found it easier to follow than I did our last comic club read, the Hellboy mm. book. Yeah, true enough. Uh, which I was just lost pretty much the entire read. Um, because if you don't already know a lot about that universe, you needed to uh, to get up to speed with it. That book required um, you to have read like seven different volumes of Hellboy in order to understand right. it. In this time. case, Department of Truth is a very readable book. Yeah. Um, it, it does have some moments, and it, intentional, I believe, on the writer's part oh, yeah. of, of sort of uh, causing you some confusion. Um, and that's part of the art, too, is, you know, it's like it, it, they're they're like making it a little harder to track every detail of to give you that same sort of sense of the details are amorphous. The details of the art are amorphous, and the the um, the way that they deliver the story can yeah um, set you off. You know, be you're a little bit off put by um, trying to catch up with where that dialogue is coming from. What? are some of the conspiracy theories it dives into. Or too many to count. Uh, it tries to kind of cover a, a generalization of a lot of the most prevalent American conspiracy theories from the false moon landing to flat earth uh, and then to some darker stuff about halfway through like false flag shootings mm -hmm. or uh, Trump versus the deep state uh, and presenting a perspective on how these conspiracies are interwoven together in a very real way uh, and at the same time uh, fortunately portraying them as uh, this crazy giant nigh mythical lie you know mm. right you know it has almost some uh, supernatural uh... yeah exactly yeah mythical in that it, it holds this, yeah, supernatural power over the world. Right. Uh, but at the same time, you know, that's just art speaking to reality. Uh, it, it was a more poignant book than I had first thought it was going to be. Yeah, it's almost like a supercharged version of the, the current reality. Uh-huh. Um, and, like, there's extra energy in in uh, the, the magic side of things, almost, where, you know, um, yeah, things things are can become real. Yeah. 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 It was a good read though. And I'm looking forward to a volume two. Uh, volume one does, does not give you a full conclusion to that story. No. Uh, but it does give you a very compelling beginning. Do we know when volume two is going to release? I believe it's out now. I think volume two and three are actually out. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, then um, we need it in. Yeah. Um, we wanted to get everybody introduced to the universe uh, and, and do this first comic club meeting, but uh, we'll be stocking the, uh, the further volume so people can continue on from there. Very cool. I would recommend it for sure, especially uh, if you're into some crazy art and some wild, wild, wild storytelling to do with some very modern and prevalent stuff. <laughs> yeah, and really, I mean, the, the first volume is such a great buy mm -hmm. um, that you you know you can't go wrong. It's one of it's one of Image's uh, nine ninety nine volumes. So yeah, you, those are always a good deal. Yeah, you can't lose on that deal. Excitingly enough, today we have some sci fi made science reality. yeah we have science real real sci-fi <laughs> finally the james webb telescope is going to have its first colored pictures revealed yeah these aren't like the the test pictures where they're trying to align the instruments or anything these are like we have it down yeah they're, they're, yeah they've got like hey we've got some interesting things we're gonna start taking photographs of and using the Full power of this battle station. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and truly, that is one of the greatest technical achievements of mankind. That thing is incredibly complex. And you can tell the people who worked on it must have been so careful with what they did for <laughs> yeah. all of it to... Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot to it, no doubt. I mean, some of those 
instruments have to work at, like, absolute zero or very close to. Yeah, and other ones have to withstand heats of up to, you know, 3200 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius. Yeah, it's a wild, wildly tuned piece of technology. But, do you think that tonight's images, uh, do you think tonight's images will be original new images of the cosmos, or will they be kind of a comparison uh, to give us a new idea of what this thing is capable of? So what we're supposed to get tonight is the first image revealed by the president and the vice president because it's that big a deal. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, it totally is. And that's going to be going on at like 5 p.m. this evening. We don't know what the image is when this podcast is recorded, so we're going to do some uh, theorizing. But we don't know the specific one. However, I have seen the like five images taken by the Hubble telescope that are of the same things that they said were their first targets. Oh, so it is kind of a comparison image. There's, there's definitely going to be a comparison. And one of them is that one that everybody has seen where there's like a thousand galaxies visible All in the that. deep space image? Yeah. Oh, man, that's uh, wild. This so, thing, I don't think there's even going to be a comparison. The scale and accuracy and color spectrum that this thing has is probably going to the precision of the images it'll be able to get. I wonder, you know, the visual confirmation of exoplanets happened in, like, the last decade, you know? That was the first time we got any sort of photo of them, and they were just, you know, four or five pixels, essentially, but we said, that is a planet orbiting a star, there we go, we've seen them. Like, we knew they existed, mm -hmm. or at least we easily theorized they did, but now we know they definitely do, seeing, believing... <laughs> these things but however, this yeah i wonder how much detail it could get if it zoomed right in on such oh it's gonna be crazy my new things yeah yeah and i think one of the images is supposedly goes back in time to the point where the universe was only about 300 million years wow. old wow. Um, so they're looking back like four and a half billion years or something like that <laughs> That's totally wild. <laughs> so, if they're going to be doing some comparison images, I can understand that. We want to see uh, what this thing is capable of for revealing new things and familiar stuff. That's that's cool with me. But, what do you think it'll be able to yeah, get original images of? Battle stations? No doubt. <laughs> well, I'm... Armadas. Yes, yeah, the, the Vulcan Armada. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if the first image is just a big face. <laughs> <laughs> Pressed up against the lens. Well, I guess the point, though, is, like, regardless of what it is we get images of, they're going to be cool, and they're going to be historical. Yes. But the fact that we're looking back hundreds of millions or billions of years, basically, in time, uh, the likelihood that things are still the same as what we're seeing now is actually pretty low. Yeah, there is some cool stuff that they can focus in on within like a thousand light years, though, where we could assume that it's still in the same general state, in a cosmic sense, at least. Uh, uh, from a thousand years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not much happens in a thousand years. Right. Yeah. So what if we, yeah, what if we saw the Death Star? <laughs> uh, from a thousand years ago, you think it'd be finished now? Uh, well, <laughs> they, they think they'd actually have it fully operational. They, like all the final panels would be on it. And Based all that on stuff. their their current lifespan, I think it would probably be they'd be on to the second one by that point. Yeah, right. <laughs> New model, probably still a sphere though. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, when they start busting out the space pyramids, that's when you got to get worried. I do wonder if it could like focus in on a planet. To a really insane degree, though. Right, if it's that kind of telescope. You know, like, to be able to, like, see that it has water yeah, or oceans yeah. or something. Yeah, we see, like, clouds or something right. on a planet in the atmosphere. Because that would be impressive. Yeah, yeah. Any any kind of trace of that would be so insane. And uh, they claim that it's incredibly precise, but, you know, like I said, exoplanet images in the past few years have really just been a few pixels. So, mm -hmm. it would be really an incredible leap for them to be able to get that kind of detail 
I know that one of, one of the ones is. that they're going to look at is one of those uh, stellar nurseries that um, has all of those huge like tendrils of smoke, basically. The pillars of eternity? That sort of thing. Yeah. But I don't know if it's that one. Right. Yeah, that might be one of the most famous images of the cosmos ever generated, you know, by Hubble. Uh, but Hubble is about to be so vastly outclassed. I was going to say, how old is Hubble? When did it go up? Like 30 years or yeah, something? Yeah, it's probably around 30 years. Wow. There's been a Think about the camera you had on your phone 30 years ago versus the camera we have now. True enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this thing is uh, more than just a camera. <laughs> the sensors on it being so finely tuned and precise. It is literally the most precise technical instrument ever produced. And according to their calibrations, it's running at like 105% efficiency, so. Dang! Nailed it! Yeah, it worked out better than they expected, according to the report. Well, dang, look how quick things move. The Hubble's only a little bit older than me. They have a whole generation of telescope to leave ahead with. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't imagine, like, Maybe they'll just let uh, schools use the Hubble or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, like 10th grade science class would be able to log into the Hubble and use it. Well, James Webb is also way further out there than Hubble is, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a lot further. It's, it might be. I think it's like the most distant uh, thing rotating around the Earth. It's about halfway between the Earth and the Moon as far as distance goes. A pretty significant distance, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that is an impressive distance from the Earth. And it speaks a lot to uh, the nature of that technology, just how precise and difficult it is to get in place. What, just the fact that it works in the first place is ridiculously awesome. I mean, it costs... Billions and billions and billions of dollars to build and send this thing out there. So, you know, I guess we'll give it the month it needs to even process the images that it takes. No doubt. But we are looking for here. some good photos here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> these I mean, better be some good photos. Yeah, I mean, they better be top-notch photos because they're expensive individually. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely paid big time for them. But at the same time, so worth it. Oh, yeah. If it is our best eye into the cosmos ever made. So stay tuned on that because I imagine we're going to want to talk about it after we see some of these spectacular photos. Yeah, no doubt. What's the next Marvel movie to come out? They have a whole big list. Thor Love and Thunder came out. And the general reaction appears to be that there's no focus for this phase. Right. You know. There's no big overarching uh, villain doing something. No, yeah. And the, the lack of a binding story is doing their movies no favors. So they've just wandered off doing... Side quests. Thor, Love and Thunder, or whatever it <laughs> yeah. is, and... Doctor Strange, multiverse of man. Well, Doctor Strange, he can pull off an independent thing. That's pretty credible that Doctor Strange could just have his own separate thing, kind of like Shang-Chi sort of thing. Totally, yeah, yeah. But not Thor? Not so much Thor, no. I don't think. I feel like... It... He's the only one out of the original three left. Oh, the, as far as the actor, the actor playing him? Uh, and just being in the universe itself. Yeah, and their continued oh, plot right. line. Yeah, you know. So, the Marvel movies. Current status. The last thing to come out was Thor. Yeah, before that we had Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. And yeah, the general sense at the moment is that there isn't much of a, a direction, a binding villain for this phase. I suppose it depends on your viewpoint if that's a problem or not. There's nothing kind of like on the loose, something that's lingering back at this point. Something that might cause galactic 
destruction. The, well, I, oh, that's the nature. The of it. Scarlet Witch storyline thing is wrapped. Uh, kind of. Everyone believes, of course, with a Fantastic Four movie upcoming, that Galactus is going to be the big threat for this phase. But you would think that we would have seen at least a clip of the Silver Surfer blasting through the cosmos at this point. Very true. Right, yeah. It's a, Why haven't they gone as far as showing us the Surfer? Yeah, because it would definitely give the rumblings of oh, there's going to be another huge right. threat and we're going to have to pull everyone and their sisters together <laughs> and we're going to have to face off against this uh, giant galactic threat. It actually would have been cool and smart to show like the surfer way out there maybe in some other galaxy while all of this other stuff was going on. Yeah, oh, yeah. delivering mm -hmm. the message of doom. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so, okay, so uh, the the latest Thor movie, I haven't seen it. it uh, how did it go over? They let this one just be a campy adventure, which is totally fine, I suppose, unless you expected to see bits and pieces of a interwoven story for this phase start to sprout up, which it doesn't really deliver on. Right. Well, maybe they're waiting on She-Hulk. Yeah, She-Hulk will kick it off. I'm oh, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Fantastic Four and She-Hulk are the oh, well. She-Hulk is a is a Disney Plus series. Yes. Yeah, and Fantastic Four is going to be a movie. Is that? It will be, I believe, or at least it was announced amidst their right. upcoming roster. I imagine that they're going to want to introduce them as some major players in the actual MCU. Uh, <sighs> but and maybe a Disney Plus series would serve them well. I don't know. I mean, maybe that you. I almost feel like they're gonna like they're gonna disappear the Fantastic Four from the MCU. <laughs> <laughs> like, like not not bring in the curse. I mean, we've talked about that before already on the podcast. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. You know, they just need to not do the origin story, or at least if they do, do it like wicked fast. Yeah, and then let them just be the heroes they are. It and is. do Doctor Doom right. Do that we know of awesome. anything else that's queued up? Ah, uh, I don't know. The She-Hulk. Yeah, She-Hulk, I mean. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's weird. That's that's like a strange uh, new series that it's going to, like, I mean, she's a lawyer. Yeah, you right? know, they're, and, they're trying to branch out into a more young adult audience, I think. Right. Making something with kind of probably sitcom aspects. Well, at the same time, being uh, very superhero-y Marvel. Yeah. It has freaking boot no, their Bruce Banner, you know. So. Well, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the prospects for their future, though, are pretty interesting. I think they keep delivering with these individual plot lines when people have come to expect uh, a, a universe that is always crossing over within itself. Yeah, massive and interwoven. Uh, and they've proven they can do that. Yeah. Uh, but it's not like all all comics are continuously hosting other comic characters. No, exactly, right? There's, there's many series and stuff where characters go out and do stuff entirely individual to their team uh, or their, their general setting. Sure, and in in some comic titles, the miniseries is the only time that they actually team up with anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And otherwise, they're doing their own thing. Right. I just think it's going to be crazy when we see a duplicate of Iron Man and Captain America show up yeah. these, <laughs> uh, after movie scenes, and it ends up being the Skrulls. <laughs> <laughs> the oh. Skrulls would be... Uh, Crazy enemy for them to start introducing in full. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can see them pulling off some absolute shenanigans. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Skrulls would be a legitimate threat that would work across a whole lot of yeah pieces of media. Yep. Suddenly they could start going back and saying that guy was a Skrull, <laughs> yeah. and so on and so forth. This politician is a Skrull. Yeah. Yeah, if they pull that off, then, yeah, there's a lot of ways that they can bring it all together. But, of course, they would be, I believe, an underlying threat for a larger, more menacing force. Which, 
Loki kind of leaves uh, Kang the Conqueror mm-hmm. wide open for them to play with. Uh, he's never actually, like, shown in full, but it is assumed that he's out there in force. And Kang can be a a world-threatening force. Oh, yeah. You know, in, in Kang versus Doctor Doom, though, I think Doom comes out on top. Really? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, in those sort of scenarios, though, the Fantastic Four are forced to help Doctor Doom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in order to defeat Kang. So you know, we, we see that all the time where the, the heroes are pulled into fighting for the villain who is slightly less worse a villain than the other villain. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. The lesser evil choice. Right. But you, you definitely imagine the Fantastic Four, potentially Doctor Doom and stuff, playing an integral role in the introduction of Galactus. And that... Their moment in the spotlight is inevitable. I mean, we talk about them on the show. We we, we utterly await <laughs> their true, worthy introduction to cinema. <laughs> but, yeah, with that, maybe with them will come along a uh, transition in this phase from kind of these loose individual stories to a more intertwined narrative. And that about does it for this one. If you liked hanging with us, please subscribe through your favorite podcast directory. Join our Discord and check out our shop, The Freakopolis Geekery. See you next time.